Okay, we'd like to get started. We have a very full program for the next hour and 15 minutes. I'm Rutherford Platt. Uh, come down from Massachusetts to uh, take part in this program. I love to come to work with MWA because it gives me a chance to wear my sailboat tie. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to see many friends, some of whom uh, may have taken part in the Turning the Tide series of public uh, forums, panels that we held at uh, Hunter College last uh, spring in, in cooperation with the MWA. Um, I, uh, we are going to deal with the subject of climate change and community resilience in 75 minutes, I told Courtney and Roland, that really was not sufficient, that we ought to have at least two hours to solve those problems. But being on a tight schedule, we'll, we'll try our best. Um, this session actually is going to begin with a video welcome from Bill McKibben, who, whose latest book is, I have the cover of it, not the whole book, because didn't want to carry it around all day. Earth, E-A-A-R-T-H, it's not a misspelling. His point is that the Earth is now already very different from what we thought it was due to climate change. So he will give that perspective um, as soon as the video is ready to begin. Here in Cancun, <laughs> but we're doing our best. Uh, maybe we can adapt to that kind of change. But there is a point past which we cannot adapt, and the planet's climatologists have told us very clearly, very clearly, that unless we make that shift off fossil fuel sooner rather than later, we're going to see temperature increases of four or five or six degrees in this century. There is no way that we're going to adapt to that kind of change. So some combination of this working to build resiliency to deal with that change that we can no longer prevent and preventing the change that we can't deal with. Those are the twin tasks. At 350, we think that the most important thing we can do is keep the basic science in mind. The most important climatologists in the world have said 350 parts per million carbon dioxide is the most we can safely have in the atmosphere if we want a planet similar to the one on which civilization evolved and to which life on Earth is adapted. Keeping that, getting back to that level of 350 parts per million is a political task that will take an immense amount of work. It will also take an immense amount of work to deal with the difficult world we're going to have in the meantime. But difficult is one thing. Humans are able to deal with difficulties. If we let things get any further out of control, then we're talking impossible. I'm very grateful to you all for the work that you do and look forward to getting to work with you in the future as we tackle every corner of this most difficult problem that we've ever faced. In the meantime, just many, many thanks for all that you do. Okay, thank you, Bill McKibben. And uh, I wish he were here to be able to follow up with some questions and discussion, but unfortunately he couldn't be, join us in person. Uh, we'll start off our live panel then today with Bill Selecki from the Institute of Sustainable Cities, uh, City University of New York, based at Hunter College. And Bill will begin, this is a slightly different order from what was in your program but we made some strategic changes uh, on a conference call last week. So Bill will be get starting with some orientation to uh, the, the larger picture of climate change and sea level rise, and then we'll move towards more um, applied uh, perspectives amongst the other panels uh, with their own particular uh, specialties that are all described in the, in, uh, bios that are in the program, so I'm not going to try to summarize everybody's achievements. Bill, are you going to be using, do you want to come up here to use, okay. 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 
Uh -huh, there you go. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for organizing this uh, this uh, day event. I, I unfortunately just got here, but uh, uh, there was quite a, a bit of excitement and sort of uh, as I was entering into the room, just lots of people talking and uh, discussing issues of the of the coastal zone. Um, for the city of New York. So um, it seems like a tremendously successful uh, day is certainly going to be had. Um, what I wanted to do is just part of this panel is literally just for a couple of minutes talk um, uh, about the question of the, the city and its connection to the, the water and the sort of risks and vulnerabilities that are associated with, with it. And a lot of what I'll say is just sort of um, briefly coming out of some work that uh, I've been doing with a number of colleagues that one of who is here today, Klaus Jacob from Columbia, as well as others, particularly Cynthia Rosenzweig at uh, NASA GIS uh, uptown and, and several others around the city. And what we, we wanted to look at is sort of part of a, an objective from the city of New York to sort of get a sense of what, what does the climate science say with respect to um, future um, uh, sea level rise and potential sort of shifts in the flooding regime that we see in the city. And a lot of of this and, and much more documentation came out in this report that's uh, on the slide, uh, which was uh, something that came out from the annals of the um, uh, New York Academy of Sciences. It's available um, through um, the city's website, I still believe, is that the case? Yeah. yeah. Uh, as well as you can buy a nice glossy copy from the New York Academy. Um, but it, it is, as it says, New York City uh, adaptation, uh, climate change adaptation in New York City building a risk management response. And one of the critical elements that sort of came out in that process is an understanding, um, you know, or sort of remembering something, uh, if, if you want to look at it that way. The city is already, uh, quote unquote, at risk to um, uh, coastal storms. Um, if you look at the issue of vulnerability um, uh, as in terms of assets and number of people, um, there are two cities along the east coast of the U.S. that are particularly at risk, or uh, there are others of, of some size. Number one is usually uh, phrased as Miami, Miami metro area. Number two is New York. All right, so this is, this is a site that is already, as by definition, sort of built to the water's edge. And the, the image on the, the right is sort of a, kind of a, is an illustrative piece that w where we try to sort of ask that question about, well, given what we, we know about uh, climate change and given some assumptions that we know about uh, potential um, increased rates of sea level rise associated with that, how is that going to influence sort of the potential for flooding in the, in the region? And I, I want to give a strong caveat. I mean, this, this document, this uh, map is in the report, but it, it, it's, it's largely, and it sort of it should be seen as illustrative, that um, the purple area noted there, these are areas that will already be um, flooded uh, with a strong uh, event, a strong storm, uh, a strong nor'easter, um, or a, let's say or something equivalent to roughly a category one hurricane. So that's well documented, sort of the one percent flood line, the areas that could be flooded um, uh, with, with storm surge. And the other colors that are illustrated there show what might happen under different scenarios of future sea level rise. And so the, the crucial thing to recognize as we, as we think about the city, there are three, uh, and look toward the future, there's a couple of things to think about. One is that there's already uh, chunks of the, of the city that you know, would be impacted through uh, an extreme event. Um, we're not even illustrating a potential flooding area of a strong hurricane, which is much more further inland. All right, so we have that zone, and that, that zone will, will, in future scenarios, also be at risk. And it could be a potential increased risk because the, that flooding um, opportunity would, would increase. The second thing is that there's large chunks of the city, given elevation and distance from the, the, the water's edge, that, you know, um, from our current understanding of sea level rise and a range of other things, you know, are well outside the range of, or outside the opportunity for storm surge. But then there's that sort of middle chunk um, areas that are not currently managed for flooding, um, particularly in the, under the 1% um, or 1 in 100 year flood regime, that we need to sort of look at more closely because it's under this, uh, it's these sites that um, will be flooded in ways that, you know, currently our, our sort of expectation is, is not con consistent with. So that's, you know, to sort of look at that graphic on the right, that's a crucial thing. Think of those three um, pieces of territory. I can go to the next slide. Oops. 
that's a, that's a cute thing that my daughter did several years ago, and still I always think of her when I present. Um, and this is just another graphic uh, from the, uh, the NPCC report, again, um, also available as something called the Climate Risk Information Packet. And rather than, you know, glazing one with, with details of numbers and so forth, I think it's important to sort of look at this as an, ex an example of the kind of information that's now available. We sort of understand as, we, as you move, as you look on this diagram from um, left to right, what you see uh, is sort of what our baseline understanding is about the, the periodicity of flooding and the flood heights associated with, with um, particular um, uh, events, either 1% one, 1 or um, uh, let's say 1 every 100 years or 1 every 500 years or 1 every 10 years. And then as you move from uh, left to right, you see changes in those depths and, and frequencies. And what you should recognize is that there's a range in terms of what the projections illustrate to us, in terms of what we might think the future might hold. But a, a crucial thing, and this is sort of an overarching element, is that because of sea level rise, the same event that would cause, uh, that would be associated with a 1% um, or 100 year flood today, could be the result of a, of a less um, small event in the future because of, of the sea level rise. Conversely, uh, a 1 percent flood or a 1 in 100 year flood today will move further inland because of sea level rise. So those are sort of other elements to sort of to think about. So as a result, the 1 in 100 year flood, um, which again we recognize as sort of a statistical kind of manipulation of existing data, um, will be occurring um, more frequently um, as the, the time period goes on. And if you look sort of again left to right, it could be occurring everywhere from 15 to 35 years by the end of, of this sort of um, this decadal slices that we've looked at, which are in this case captured by the 2080s. So with these two slides, I just wanted to introduce a little bit of information as I close. One is that the city is already um, at risk and certainly one of the primary sites at risk uh, to coastal inundation uh, from extreme events. We recognize that and certainly the, you know, obviously institutions like the OEM or, are responding to that. This, this risk will change with uh, sea level rise and that it's in that sort of middle ground, those places that aren't currently managed as risk sites that I think we need to draw a lot of our attention. And then if you think about the data, we re need to recognize that there's continual refinement and that there's a range of, of what future conditions might hold. And with this, we'll, we'll find a, a more frequent flooding cycle um, with sea level rise. Thanks. By the way, I, I forgot to mention that uh, we decided before the session began not to try to use cards for questions here. Uh, we'll hold the questions until after all the speakers, but then we'll just use the, the good old raising of the hand, and there will be mics, portable mics on both aisles. Uh, with a room this size, it's a little unwieldy to use cards. Thank you, Bill. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Aaron Cook from the New York City Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. Great, thanks, Rod. And it's really a big thank you to the MWA for this wonderful gathering. It's really incredible to see all the people gathered today and out in the hallways. And, uh, and my other panelists, it's really an honor to be with you today. I just want to speak really briefly, hit on a couple points. What our office's role in and all of this is, what we've done to date on, on planning for, for climate change uh, resilience, and then to speak a bit about what we've done on, on community outreach engagement, and then hopefully I'll offer some thoughts about where we might be able to go from here and, and particularly want to seek uh, ideas from, from others and call for ideas from others. Uh, our office was founded back in 2006 to, to create a sustainability plan for the city. Plan YC is, is synonymous with many things, uh, one of them being that we, uh, it's basically the city's climate action plan. We set a mitigation goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by 2030, and, and we have seen some real progress towards that to date. Uh, also in Plan YC, it established a, a, a series of initiatives to look at the issue of how we're going to adapt to climate change. Uh, several of those have, have been well underway. We, uh, the mayor convened the New York City Panel on Climate Change through some generous support from the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, the work that, that Bill has talked about today was uh, our office was, was heavily involved in creating and really felt it was necessary to, to better understand those, those conditions and what we may expect in the future. Uh, we've also been convening uh, critical infrastructure 
operators, planners, and on the agencies, both from the, uh, from the city, state, and federal government that, that own and operate critical infrastructure, as well as those private companies, to try to assess what the, what the climate change impacts may be on their infrastructure and what are some strategies we can do to uh, address those. We've looked with our Green Codes Task Force, we're working with a series of building and planning experts to look at what some of the implications may be for our buildings and, and communities. We're working with FEMA as, as we speak. We've flown uh, planes to acquire better elevation data called LIDAR. Uh, we're engaged with them to talk about how we can update flood maps to better uh, reflect risk. Uh, we recently awarded a grant from the Center for Disease Control to look at the implications of public health and climate change, and that's a process that's about to get underway. Uh, obviously, uh, Office of Emergency Management does a great deal of work. I'll let uh, uh, Amber address that. And so there's many other things that we've been doing to plan for, for climate change. Um, a lot of it has been focused on trying to better understand and assess what we may be expecting, uh, understanding, collecting data. And now we're at this point where uh, we're trying to move towards uh, implementing actual regulatory and po po policy changes and, and other practices. Uh, how we engage with communities and how we work with others is obviously a critical piece of this. Plan YC did have an initiative to do engagement with communities. There was a series of workshops organized back in 2008 as pilots, uh, working with some, some community groups, UPROs being one of them, We Act, uh, different groups, one in each borough. And we did a couple of engagement uh, sessions and I think at the time realized that in order to do real sustained engagement, we needed to have better information and better data. And, and I think we recognize that it's something that we haven't fully uh, uh, followed through on a commitment we made. And we, we, we seek to, uh, we recommit ourselves to, to continue to engage with communities and trying to understand what, what would that actually look like. We learned some pretty critical lessons from those, those pilot sessions we organized. One is that without having better baseline data, this was before we had the climate change projections, that it's really difficult to go out and talk to communities about what impacts they may face. Um, it's hard to talk to them in, in, in ways that actually mean something. So uh, whether you, and I think this is a lesson to be learned, is so how, do you, how do you engage them? Do you talk about some potential scenario 50 years out in the future, or do you talk to them? Uh, the lesson I think is we learned is that we, we need to talk to them more about the risks that they face in their communities that aren't necessarily about climate change, but it's about real implications of, of flooding and that time when the subway was, was shut down and what it would mean if that was shut down again. Uh, so that's a lesson we've learned. And, and also looking at what are the appropriate partnerships in communities and what are the, what are the resources it would actually take to do real outreach and, and to continue to, to sustain uh, the, the city's involvement within communities to empower them as well as to learn from them. And, and so this work continues. We are in the process of updating Plan YC. It was released in, on Earth Day in 2007. Uh, we are uh, updating every four years and that's coming out in April. And we're essentially rewriting the, the whole climate change chapter and, and laying out a, a strategic planning process and trying to understand what, is, what does that actually look like what is the role for us as far as facilitating community planning? How do we support local communities? How do we go out there and, and address, uh, involve them in meaningful ways? And so this is something we're, we're very much uh, interested in. As part of the Plan YC update process, we've, we have been holding community conversations. Five have taken place already. There's three additional taking place in December. Uh, information about that's on our website, nyc.gov slash planyc 2030. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Department of City Planning on the Conference of Waterfront to, to do engagement with them on the issue of climate change, but we recognize that there's, there's much work to be done. And so I think my message really is I, I come here not so much to tell you how the city is going to do it or, or to have the silver bullet answer, but really to learn from the other panelists here and also to, to hear from the audience members about what is the appropriate role of government, how do we uh, work with communities, what's the best way to work with communities effectively, and, and really to, to help us, uh, I invite you to, to help us think through how we can, can better work with, with communities on this issue. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to the other panelists. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Uh, we're moving from the, moving gradually from the macro to the micro, uh, and in the middle is the emergency management preparedness program or campaign at the City Office of Emergency Management, and Amber Green is going to tell us about that. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So a little bit about the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, we were established 
actually used to be part of the mayor's office, but now we're a full city agency, but our standalone agency. And our main goal is to coordinate emergency response and recovery for the city of New York. What we're talking about in terms of climate change is a little bit different in terms of some of the disasters that we deal with. So most of the things that you see OEM in terms of a response, you may see something immediate, like there may be a three alarm fire, a family's displaced, and now we put a plan and a specific thing into action on opening up disaster centers. Or we may have a power outage or something like that, where now we need to put in uh, to plans uh, our power outage, power outage effect plan for New York City. But climate change is a little bit gradual, and that type of immediate action takes a lot of community involvement and planning and a lot of education. At the New York City Office of Emergency Management, my role is to basically take a lot of the planning information that we do in terms of the response plans and evacuation plans and those things and make that information accessible to community members, to make that information digestible to them so that they can make the behavioral changes that we'd like them to make. A couple of the things that we're talk that when we're speaking to people about preparedness is that we're talking about the immediate threats that they can that they can have. Specifically for New York City, New Jersey, and these are things that, you know, regardless of any type of emergency we're, we're focused on. Um, I think it was uh, Bill? Yeah. The, yeah, the other Bill. <laughs> the other Bill mentioned the fact about uh, the storm surge, storm surge zones. That's something that definitely OEM is responsible for communicating to the public in terms of if they live outside of those zones or if they live in those zones and so forth. For climate change, we will see a, a high rise in sea level which could bring erosion. So you could potentially have people that were not in flood zones that now have to add, you know, get extra insurance or move inland and so forth. But our main job is to think about how can we talk to people about the risks associated with living so close to the water. Some people have no choice to live by the water. There are a lot of uh, public housing developments that are on the area, so those residents would be risks and we have to find better ways to communicate with them about preparedness and about actions that they can specifically take. And so that's what we've been doing at OEM is to be able to provide enough information, enough resources and ways to engage the public. Specifically with our program, we do focus primarily on a community level for Red in New York and it's about engaging communities. We post probably about 400 plus community events targeting seniors, people with disabilities, vulnerabilities and so forth to better educate them and empower them on ways that they can keep themselves and their families safe in any disaster. Our hope is to think about when we're talking to them about the sort of micro emergencies that could potentially be large emergencies. You know, a small fire to someone, you know, can devastate their entire, you know, it doesn't have to take I would say like a, a giant emergency for people to be affected by something. A small fire could easily you know, destroy someone's household, their way of life, and just getting them to think about how those impacts would, would affect them. One of the other things that we think about in terms of planning is that the storm's intensity. As we do experience you know, longer summers or hotter weather, we do face the risks of coastal storms. You know, New York City specifically is well overdue for a major coastal storm, and it's not a lot of people think that New York City would actually be affected by those storms. And not talking about the people here, but mostly the people that live in the community. They're not thinking about, you know, what, you know, a major coastal storm would do for their neighborhood and what that would do to their way of life, how it would impact the subway systems, how it would impact their modes of transportation, things that they're used to. So it's about not scaring them into preparing, but making them aware of the risks that are associated. Additionally, when we talk about climate change, we're planning for emergencies um, such as extreme heat. You know, we could experience longer summers where now we have seniors and people with disabilities, people that have uh, respiratory illnesses that are now, you know, adversely affected by the effects of climate change. And that's talking a little bit more about, you know, engaging the public health and making sure that people know what it is that they can do. How specifically we work with the community are a couple of things, and I'll outline a couple of programs that are actually national programs and some of the programs that may be available specifically in your region. One of those is the Citizen Corps Council, which is a federal funded program by the Department of Homeland Security. And that main goal of that program is to better engage community organizations, not-for-profit groups around volunteering and empowering them to be prepared. It's about developing agency partnerships, offering trainings and things like that. So those are some ways that we try to engage the public a little bit better. The Mayor's, off, the mayor's uh, Community Assistance Unit is very active, a great partner of OEM and being able to provide community contacts, but as community organizations and community residents, it's important for them to know how they can tap into government and that would be the best way to do that. One of the things that I'd like to stress is in terms of how we can engage the public better is to provide them with actual tools. With OEM, we have several training programs available. One is the CERT program, which is the Community Emergency Response Teams. And this is where we're taking individuals in the community to train them in 11 weeks. It's a pretty intensive course, but about 11 weeks on specific disaster skills. If we experience you know, major coastal storms and things like that, 
Most people as city dwellers, we don't know how to board up our apartments. We don't know how to you know, work to you know, do the things that people maybe in Florida or Texas are used to doing. So it's about training people on those sort of you know, hardcore skills that they can be able to protect themselves and their families. That's a free training. So it's a lot of you know, getting information out to the people that can best uh, take advantage of that as, as bestly as possible. Specifically with our Ready New York Preparedness Campaign, as I mentioned before, we do host a lot of community events, but a lot of what we do is uh, focus on building partnerships and getting people engaged and getting them to think about preparedness in ways that they haven't before, really empowering them. One of the things that we found success in, specifically in emergency management, is working, you know, adults don't change their behaviors, but children do. So a lot of our focus has been on empowering children and families to think about how they can keep themselves safe and engaged and uh, better prepared. So those are some of the things that, in terms of the city, what we're doing to better, you know, learn, uh, to better engage from the public. But with, again, echoing Aaron's sentiments as well, it's really important for me to get a sense of what we can do and how we can do our jobs a little bit better so that people can feel a part of the planning process and not so much as, you know, government is talking down and telling you specifically what it is that you need to do. So as much information as I can get from the fellow panelists, I welcome that today. So thank you for your time. Some of the effects are very slow and gradual, and others are very sudden and very dangerous, and we have to address it both from both perspectives. Um, our next panelist here is Tony McDonald, who is director of the Urban Coast Institute at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Now, I'm not worried about because I can't see my own slide. Fine. <laughs> Did, did anybody hear what I just said? <laughs> it was really, this is, really insightful. This is Tony McDonald, very insightful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, as, as we're getting teed up, I'll, I'll, a, a couple of introductory comments. It's, it's great to be here. It's actually quite a flashback for me. If you haven't read the bio, I actually done a stint at the New York City Parks Department with Mayor Koch. I actually worked for Mayor Koch in Washington at the time we were negotiating uh, the formation of this museum. So it's wonderful uh, to be here all these year, years later. Um, and now I'm actually uh, back uh, in the area. I'm in New Jersey at Monmouth University, about 60 miles south of here. Uh, at the Urban Coast Institute, and our job there really is to connect uh, some of these policy questions uh, to the local community. So I think I'm a little bit the, the, the transfer from some of these bigger issues. There's an awful lot going on here in some of the bigger questions to how do you actually engage those communities. The title of this uh, panel is From the Bottom Up. So we really do need to, I think, uh, spend a little bit more time on that because all of these acronyms and all of these programs and all of this information, which really is fabulous and getting better and more focus still is beyond the resources and capability of most of the communities and individuals that we're trying to target. So there is a huge gap there, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the efforts that we're working on um, to do that. Um, the other sort of general introductory comment I want to make is really one of perspective a little bit, is again, I have agreed with everything that's been, been said here, but I have a little bit probably more concern. I mean, the reality is New York and the New Jersey Shore, where I'm from, were essentially built on aspirations which ignored all of the advice you're going to hear today. So the reality is that the places we live, and much of what is great about them, is actually based on a whole different uh, paradigm, if you excuse that expression. So we do really, really, really need to recognize the depth of the social networks that we need to address as we're trying to, to encourage the kind of change uh, that we're trying to uh, advance. So again, this is just a general concept, again, to really recognize all, all the time that this is an interconnected system that really, if you're looking at this, you do, do need to be always cognizant of the natural systems, the social systems, the coastal processes and weather. These are all interconnected systems, and I think a lot of programs tend to be focused on one or other aspect of that, which is great, but I think we also have to recognize how interconnected these are, and that the, the solutions and something in the sort of pre preparation of this panel that uh, I, I wanted to stress is to remember, even in places like Manhattan, there are natural systems uh, involved as well as um, engineered systems and social and economic systems that we need to be thinking about as we're doing our strategies. And I sort of feel a little bit like we talk a lot about uh, climate change, and I think really, you know, I heard somebody observe that sea level rise is probably really uh, the, the essentially a big economic development program for Dutch engineering firms. And that's a little bit of a joke 
But do not kid yourselves. There is a lot of money and energy being invested right now in New York and other places uh, to engineering solutions. So I also express a little bit of concern that we need to remember always and probably push a little harder on the natural solutions uh, and, and some of the others as we're looking uh, to, to address um, resilience issues and response. And sometimes uh, we also need to be a little careful with the language because um, the reality is resilience, adaptation, these things don't all mean the same things to people. So let's make sure we also, in working with communities, be sure that we're clear as to what we mean uh, by that. So again, one uh, initiative I'm going to talk about a little bit is, again, I'm really working uh, at the national level with some groups that are really looking at uh, sea level rise and inundation community workshops, how to develop tools. We heard that in the last thing. Communities often really want solutions. They don't really want to. The risk message is an interesting one, but sometimes not enough to change behaviors. The reality is the National Flood Insurance Program has been sending mixed signals and mixed incentives for, for 25 years, and we're not able to change that. So the concept of risk alone and hazards alone is not necessarily enough to change uh, the approaches of communities. So we need to be aware of those lessons we've learned um, from the, our, our past failures. But I think the concept that perhaps sea level rise, or as we like to think of it, is today's big flood is tomorrow's high tide. It's not necessarily the flood and the risks only, but the concept of this slow change that Rudd referred to. The reality is really you're seeing a lot of changes that are going to flood our infrastructure, flood some of our sewage, sewage treatment facilities. So we do need to be thinking about that a little bit. So we really are looking um, at this through some of these national efforts through workshops and really what is the kind of information that we really do need on a regular basis uh, to address uh, resilience and hazards in a consistent way. So there's a variety of reports, and this is just one that I was involved in that really talked very specifically about some of the communications tools, the mapping and visualization tools, and I'm going to talk to you specifically about some examples that we're working on in New Jersey uh, that imp try to implement some of these uh, recommendations based on the feedback we've gotten from communities and users. You always need to be very aware of who your audience is when you're designing these solutions and these tools, because if they can't access them, then they're really um, no good, no matter how interesting uh, they may be. And this is actually a picture from the Shrewsbury River, which is just south of here if you go across the bay and to recognize where we've come from and to illustrate my point about how we've fundamentally changed the natural systems. They still have natural elements, though, so we need to not think of them as gone, but how do we recreate them in ways for the future? And that's another general point I want to make is really, I think, folks, tend to really not necessarily be future driven. They tend to be past driven. So they want to restore nature to the past. They want to restore local communities to what they knew when they were growing up. So how do you address that when you have a fundamentally changing world, as we heard um, from uh, McKibben at the beginning of the census, that we really are going to have a different future. And how do we adapt to that? And how do we become resilient to that? So again, we need to look a little bit on two projects I'll mention um, very briefly is this Coastal Community Adaptation Initiative which um, the Urban Coast Institute is working on with New Jersey DEP and a New Jersey Sea Grant, and Darina Frizero, who's one of our partners from DEP, is in the room uh, today. And another is a, a project that's being worked on by the Jacques Cousteau Nears and Rutgers University on also a place-based decision support system. I think the concept of being place-based and being careful about generic comments about communities um, is obviously important in New York. Um, I don't have to tell our panelists how diverse New York is and the nature of the communities are so different uh, that any general statements are almost going to be um, not necessarily useful. So again, this is just a tool I'll move through real quickly, but I think there's a lot of work like this being done in the region and around the country to really work at the community level to sort of develop these vulnerability indices and these tools so that they can use them to really inform their planning. But again, we really are expecting outcomes from this. This isn't just an edu in addition to being an education tool, it is actually a decision support tool so that they might actually do something different. So we're really trying to develop this. So this is one of these time series things that you really look quickly where we're trying to embed within a broader vulnerability concept, which comes out of some of the emergency management planning work that's traditionally been done, to add um, uh, some concern and a level of information related to sea level rise as well. So this, again, hasn't traditionally been part of a lot of the flood models and a lot of the flood scenarios that have been incorporated into local planning. So we're trying to work with communities to develop these, um, these models and these sort of time series. And this is sort of the creeping kind of, you know, virus kind of slides, and you see them a lot, also in land use scenarios. Again, you see a lot of this land use, like, can you believe how much we've actually grown our footprint? Again, we've seen them, but we continue to grow and develop. So let's recognize that this is really, if we're going to change it, we need to focus on it. So we actually think we need to couple these visualization tools uh, with um, sort of questionnaires and some really interactive direct one-on-one -on -one processes with the communities, because again, otherwise they don't feel enough of the process. So we're also developing a getting to resilience questionnaire 
which we're testing out with some of the local communities. And it is both a dialogue as well as a self-assessment of where the communities stand with regard to um, uh, resilience, both building on some of the, the, the stuff we just heard about um, from traditional emergency management to broader issues on social resilience, really one of the main lessons coming out of out of um, uh, Louisiana was a, re was a recognition about vulnerable communities and uh, elderly folks and, and, and other folks who are not really able to respond quickly to events and we need to be much more attuned to some of those social elements. Um, so moving on, we are the, the next process and the next project is a little bit more uh, in-depth and, and detailed um, work that's being done uh, on a decision support tool down in uh, southern Jersey in the Barnegat Bay. And this is an area which has seen a lot of growth and a lot of development on the land side uh, and, and potential future development uh, coming down the pike. So they're really trying to get ahead of it. This is a place where maybe they can get a little ahead, ahead of some of those development patterns and also build in more natural elements in terms of um, natural resources and some of the ecosystem services that might be involved with natural restoration and conservation. So again, they're looking at land cover and land use uh, models uh, in that area um, and developing that over the next uh, year or so. So again, the objective of these tools is really to, to look at this place-based vulnerability to inform, inform land use planning. It's really a, a, a system of decision support tools. It includes information, forecasts, and expected habitat changes. Really, forecasts that people rely on that aren't presented to them, that they're part of designing um, these forecasts and these alternatives, uh, and also easily uh, translatable for decision makers, as I mentioned earlier. So again, I think the concept of potential risks, risks is important, but I think the concept of visualizing a future that you want to design toward is as important, if not more important, if you're going to get community buy-in uh, to resilience uh, strategies. So again, just a couple of conclusory remarks. There's a crap, crap load of information out there. There's a lot of resources for communities who want to be involved, um, and I'm just mentioning a couple of examples. But again, I do think you need this shared community vision of what's at risk. You need to identify these community qualities that the stakeholders want to protect and face in, in, in the face of sea level rise. Again, you can't assume um, what those values are. Um, you need to really define the geographic scope and timescales of concern. Again, if you're not clear on that up front, you're going to get really different kind of results and assumptions about the significance of those recommendations. Uh, you will obviously involve critical partners and stakeholders. That's the whole concept of the community bottom-up uh, framework. And again, future states I mentioned. Critical data and information tools continue to reduce uncertainty. Uncertainties, I think, are something that really within the sea level rise context, you know, it's just not a question of the science. You know, they've said, they've shown that all of these leaks, that the science is good. <laughs> There's no real debate about the science as science, but a lot of folks continue not to believe that. So there are belief systems that come into play as well. Um, development of the tools, uh, the policy alternatives. Again, we've heard something about how do we actually implement policies um, that, 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 that drive over the long term our planning and our implementation into different things. I think actually infrastructure investment in this region is one of the main areas. We heard the green infrastructure discussion. We hear roads infrastructure. There's a lot of money that's going to go into rebuilding our infrastructure. Let's make sure we, don't, we, we take advantage of that from a resilience and adaptation point of view, because that's where the money is, fr quite frankly. And it's not necessarily, unfortunately, in the individual restoration or adaptation projects. And lastly, it's really comprehensive and consistent communication um, strategy, institutional capacity, and the toughest of all, marshalling all that into political will. So thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. I want to underline those last two words, political will. Uh, we'll come back to that later if we have time. Um, our next, uh, thank you very much, Tony. Our next uh, panelist is Dr. Lee Stewart, who community organizer in New York, uh, working on issues of food security, affordable housing, educational reform, and parks advocacy. And I just met uh, Lee on the boat this morning, and uh, we have a lot to talk about. Very interesting. Hurry on. about uh, what do I think about how to, how to organize the community for climate resiliency, four things came right to mind. Uh, one was cut to the chase, uh, start from scale, uh, don't reinvent the wheel and don't leave anyone out. Uh, so what do I mean by that? My work in community organizing here in New York really visualizes the city set up into three sectors, the public sector, the government, the private sector, uh, corporate interest, and then what could be called the voluntary sector, civil society, third sector, call it what you want. 
And my work has been primarily in that third sector with groups and individuals who are somewhat outside of the traditional power structures, under-recognized by them, um, often with no voice. And moderately good community organizing at that scale, which builds up the power in that base and gets it into relationship with the other two sectors, can eventually get to kind of grudging recognition. Yeah, we've got to listen to the community. They've got some kind of point there. And um, a somewhat more just allocation of resources, whether that be jobs or better schools or police protection or housing, whatever. Um, but in the very best cases, what happens is all of those three sectors grow in capacity together. When I was organizing for housing in the South Bronx, I spent at least as much time organizing HPD as I did organizing uh, for housing interests in the Bronx. So when I say cut to the chase, let's start from the very beginning that organizing for climate resiliency is going to require us to organize in all three sectors. This conference so far has been really good at organizing in the governmental sector, and we're hearing more and more from the civil society sector. But for my way of thinking, the private sector, which is a huge piece of New York City economy, New York City function, is not, not very well heard here. Uh, so we can start that we're going to have to organize something in all three of those sectors. There will still be emerging relationships that can evolve and people can learn, but, but we, we need to say what, are the, what, what does organizing look like in each of those three sectors and what can they do best in that sector that will help benefit for all. So what does organized look like? I couldn't find a definition of what we thought organizing for climate resiliency was, so I made one up, and it's just a test balloon. Uh, Amber may, and I may disagree, but I would say that we'll be sufficiently organized when 85% of all of us who live and work here know the basic facts about climate change, are taking mitigation actions in their da daily life. Uh, friend Bill McKibben, notwithstanding, I think we still need to practice those mitigations at every chance and organize to do that. People need to know what the likely impacts are and what they can take, uh, actions they can take in their own life. Um, so that's, where I, that's kind of where I'd like to see us go. To get there, we're going to have to start with scale not build to scale. I've recently been reading David Gershon's work on social change 2.0, and I recommend it pretty highly. Um, he has an idea that the first 15 percent, most of who are you in the room, are part of that, are people who are going to jump into something no matter what. You're easy to organize your, 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 you know, the likely suspects. There's another 35 percent, the next 35 percent, who will come in because they will have enough buzz about this that they'll want to join something cool. The next 35 percent will come in because by then it's kind of mainstream and it's not too risky and everyone else is doing so, why not? And 15 percent will never come in. So we don't need to organize, we don't need to spend a lot of effort on the 15th the end 15. Let's start on the first 15 percent. I look back about what I knew in New York and in time since I've been here, one of the things that really was a, a city run campaign that had a big impact on changing New Yorkers behavior, specific behaviors. Some of you may remember it was a comic strip that played in every New York City subway car with Raul and Marisol and Julia about HIV AIDS. And we all followed that. Anyone who rode a subway system learned about con uh, what the symptoms of HIV AIDS were, con uh, talking to our partners, wearing condoms, taking our meds. And it had a huge impact in, in how the city looked at that. So something similar like that uh, for climate change and, and resiliency. Another place, place of where we can start at scale that um, is in New York City's public and private payrolls. About 20 years ago, when indigenous leaders around Mount Everest in Tibet started realizing that they needed to organize for conservation, not just for preservation of the natural environment, for the preservation of their very cultures, one of the things that they did was set up, make sure that that conservation was part of every job description in the area. So whether you were a government official, a teacher, a shepherd, whomever, part of your job actually became a conservation effort. And I wonder in the giant payrolls of New York City if everybody's job description here had something to do with climate mitigation and climate resiliency and, adaptive and ability to react in an extreme event. That would be a huge way that we could get to scale pretty quickly. Um, but, I mean, we also can't forget the traditional community organizing familiar to any social movement in the last hundred years, social analysis, power analysis, relationship building, leadership development, direct civic action. And we don't have to start from scratch. I mean, there are 400 organizations that are part of the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. There are hundreds of others. Uh, these are still part of the 15 percent, but they're the base from which we can begin. Uh, and beyond that, uh, Every building is a potential organizing base in New York City, and just because you live upland doesn't mean this, you, we can forget you about that. That's a, 
they're part of this project too. Every synagogue, every church, every mosque, every temple, every classroom, every division of government, every branch of corporation, every family, every neighborhood, every business. It's really a community organizer's dream. Uh, it's a remarkable opportunity for unity of action and spirit. But that being said, uh, the decades upon decades of environmental injustice against particularly New York City's communities of color and lower income communities, um, how successful we're going to be in organizing a one city ethos about this really depends on authentically incorporating those voices. And we need to make sure that the impacts of climate change and all that that means, which globally right now are falling most heavily on the poor and the most marginalized, 